difficult. So not only do open source tools help me um, do science, but it also enables me to do trainings and actually teach the people um, in the places that I'm studying how to use some of the tools that I'm working with because it's free and it's open source and it's easy for them to use as well. Um, so I'm super grateful to all of to the work that all of you do. Um, <coughs> you want to introduce yourself? Um, <coughs> hi. So my name is Manuel uh, Lutuzé. Um, so I'm the director and co-founder of an organization called Data Pop Alliance. Uh, we're based in New York, um, but I tell you more about it when I when I talk, and I'm happy to be here as well. Cool. Okay. Um, so I want to give you a sense of kind of inspiration for for my own inspiration of where this talk is coming from. Um, and it's really um, thinking about the ways that big data and science can be used um, for change and to combat some of the biggest problems that we have in our world. So my colleague on this project, who's not here today, Bessie Schwartz, works at the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication. And they're doing a lot of research uh, around how do you actually convince people that climate change is real? How do we communicate science and data to different uh, political groups, people of different cultures? And then how do we leverage that to actually do something to solve a problem? Um, and we see data as kind of one way to address some of those issues. So this is a blog post that she wrote um, on Data Pop's website. So you'll hear more about that organization in a second. Um, and kind of what we see um, is that the next breakthrough in big data should be to kind of challenge the power dynamics that have been happening in this space and by putting data into people's hands instead of just extracting data from them. Um, so that's what our project hopefully um, responds to and what I'm going to show a little bit of today. So, okay. Um, so we're going to kind of open up and talk about the ways that we see big and open data as useful for climate resilience and disaster risk reduction. Talk a little bit about what that means. I'll show you an example of a project that we're working on in Google Earth Engine and what that uh, product is and how that works. Um, and then uh, Manuel is going to talk about his network, the Data Pop Alliance. Um, and so hopefully we'll run through that in about 20 minutes. And then I'd really like to get a discussion going both questions from you and your feedback and ideas about how we can bridge the scientist, developer, practitioner, citizen gap a little bit better. So hopefully we'll have a lot of time for that discussion. And I realize that um, a lot of you are doing this work already, so I'm excited for you to kind of give some of your feedback and experiences working in this space, what's worked and what hasn't. Um. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah, so I'm just going to do a quick overview of the space, big data and development for some of you. I mean, I, I, mean I, I never know when I talk about this topic, I never know, it's like the, the, the mesh of the, of the audience. So, okay. this one's recording. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll just do like, an, like a, a big picture kind of um, overview of the, of, of the space. Um, and I hope you can hear me and understand me despite my uh, pretty thick French accent. So Data Pop Alliance uh, was created by the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, uh, MIT Media Lab, and the UK Overseas Development Institute. Uh, and so I have affiliations in all three institutions. Um, and we started about um, a year and a half ago. Uh, actually, soon after I met Beth and, and, and Bessie uh, at the International Crisis Mappers Conference in, 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 in Nairobi. Um, you want to go to the next slide? Um, so I also do like political cartooning on, on the side. And I illustrate all of my papers, etc. So this is just um, so one one cartoon that I did uh, a year ago to sort of I mean to try and convey the novelty and and the sort of the, some of the challenges of of, um, of of big data. So you see this so like older gentleman wondering what's what's happening, uh, and well, hopefully the cartoon is sort of like self-explanatory. Otherwise, it sort of defeats the purpose of having uh, <laughs> a cartoon. Um, but anyway, so this is the context. It's like the big data revolution or wave. Uh, and some people say that it's just a buzz and, and it's just a hype. And, uh, uh, but I don't think it's a hype. I think there, were, there are misconceptions about it, but I don't think it's a hype. I think it's something, something very, uh, very tangible and consequential. Uh, 
So in the realm, uh, so my background is social science, uh, development, uh, work for the UN, I work for, I work for the French government. Uh, so in these so like spaces, on, in these environments, the appeal of big data has been very much on the sort of, on the measurement potential, whether and how big data could be used to better monitor, measure poverty, for instance, but also the kind of stuff that, that Beth and Bessie work on, uh, vulnerability to, to, um, to flooding, uh, for instance. Um, and of course, we live in a very highly unequal uh, world, uh, and so there are, there's been this, this, this discussions about big data being the new oil, or data being the new oil, or data being the new whatever, black, or the new everything. So this cartoon gets to this, the question, if we talk about the new oil, uh, we should also you know, keep in mind the, the negative consequences of the old oil in terms of, I mean, not just on the environment, but also on, on, on political empowerment participation, corruption, etc., uh, which led to the development of this notion of, of the resource curse that you may have heard of. Uh, so then the question is, how can we avoid a, sort of like a, a data curse that data is, can be used um, for increased uh, political participation and empowerment as opposed to, well, just the, the, the opposite. Uh, so this is something that, that Bessie and Beth have also in mind as they work uh, on their project. Uh, that is not just a technical issue, it's also a very deeply political uh, issue. Um, then, so, my one sentence summary of big data is that big data is not big data. Um, so that big data is not about size, it's actually very granular um, data. So this is just one example of what a kind of big data stream. Um, so it's the movement of, yeah, so it's the movement of one individual in Rwanda over four years. So. I'm sure you're familiar with the, with the sort of, I mean, I guess as developers with big data as, as, as data streams and sets. Uh, but the point is that big data, the, the sort of defining feature of big data as data are to be very granular personal data uh, at high frequency. So it's, it's, it's not really about size. That's the sort of main takeaway message from this, from this, from this slide. So initially, uh, big data was um, was discussed in terms of the three V's of big data. So I'm sure you've all heard ad nauseum about the three V's of big data: of volume, velocity, and variety. These sort of the new kinds of data coming up from digital devices and services. Um, so my take on that is that this is so like old news that we should get rid of, and actually very few people now in the the space of big data and development still refer to the three Vs because it sounds like very 2012, which in this space that goes, expands very fast is a long time ago. So I try to frame big data and development around the three Cs, just because I don't know, people like having like, stuff to like, you know, get their, their graph, so three Vs, three Cs. But I think it sort of makes sense. So the first C is just like crumbs, so it's big data as data, so with a small b and a small d, if you will as opposed to big B, big D for big data as an ecosystem. So big data as data is like these crumbs that we generate as we use cell phones, credit cards, Twitter, Facebook, uh, remote sensing, uh, etc. The second C is capacity. So it's like actually what, what so Beth is going to talk about and what you work on. So it's machine learning, uh, the blending of statistical and machine learning techniques, uh, power, more, like more powerful uh, algorithms and, and computers. Uh, so that's the second C of big data, capacities. The third one is very important. I think it's like the community around and in big data. So it's researchers, private sector actors, public sector actors, actually people generating the data. In a sense, I think we should think of big data as research. So if you ask what can big data do for something, um, it's not so much what can big data do as data, it's uh, what big data can do as, like, as a phenomenon. And I think increasingly it will be referred to and, and approached as a phenomenon, the same way research, research is. Next slide, and I need to move uh, fast. So, um, so in, in this paper uh, two years ago, uh, we came up with other co-authors, so Patrick Vink and Patrick Meyer, with this taxonomy of big data, how can big data be used, so like concretely, so, and we came up with this three-tier taxonomy, nothing groundbreaking, others have like proposed uh, taxonomies that are sort of similar. So the first one is just descriptive. So you can think of heat maps of Twitter feeds or word clouds. So it just gives you a sense of what's going on, but you, can't, you don't really make any inference. It's like, it's, it's, it's descriptive. The second is predictive in two senses of the term. One is, is forecasting. Uh, 
It's about what is going to, what is likely to happen next. Is there going to be a crime? Is there going to be uh, like a conflict? Is there going to be uh, rain? I mean, weather forecasts are exactly that. The second sense of uh, predictive is inference. So if you have big data streams coming in, you try and infer like some underlying phenomenon that, uh, that, is, that is happening at the same time, but it's not in the future, it's right now. So you make an inference, but you try to predict poverty, for instance, I'll give you examples. The third one, which is like frontier work in big data and research is about prescription. So it's causal inference. So you have to be able, and it's actually very hard to make to establish a causal relationship between an X and a Y or a delta X and a delta Y. Um, and for that, you need to, I mean, it's sort of like the holy grail of so social science research anyway, um, but it's actually very hard with, with big data. Okay, so next slide. So speaking of cartoons, don't worry, I'm not gonna go over like all of these, but so this is on our website. So it's something that I did for uh, um, an article a year ago where they were basically asking me to, so that little guy is me, they were asking me to draw, uh, to do a comic strip about how you do um, so like machine, like statistical machine learning, how if you have cell phone activity, you can actually try and infer poverty levels or socioeconomic levels um, in a given city or country. So I'm just basically, instead of writing, well, this is step one, step two, et cetera, et cetera, I just did it in a comic strip. Uh, and I'll try to give you, I'll give you like a, a short overview of how this works. And you may be familiar with these techniques uh, in the next um, slide. Um, so there are lots of discussions around applications of big data in the realm of m monitoring and measurement. So there are two things that, that I want to mention first in this slide. First is, so the UN is coming up, the UN system is coming up with new uh, development goals that are called the sustainable development goals that replace the existing millennium development goals that come to an end, or at least the agenda, the framework, come to an end, comes to an end in 2015, so this year. So they're going to be replaced with sustainable development goals, 16 right now, uh, and there are lots of discussions about whether and how big data can help measure, monitor, and also achieve these 16 goals. This is something that, uh, so Beth and Bessie worked on for a UN report. So they sort of asked themselves the question, how can big data be used for disaster risk reduction? Um, and they sort of went through the sort of three step that you usually, that people think about when they think about disaster risk reduction. And then the sort of corresponding potential data sets and tools that could be applicable, relevant at each of these different steps. Um, so so it's a, it's in a sense, like it's a different taxonomy, but you see like sensor data uh, is usually pretty big when, uh, so re remote sensing data, but also sensor like physical sensors in the realm of disaster, disaster risk reduction. Um, so next slide. Um, so overall, there, are, there have been, as I mentioned, like lots of discussions about how could the data be used. Um, so I'm sure you've heard about the Google Fruit Trend, sort of like uh, hype, and then it's sort of the, 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 the bubble like, you know, burst, and then they recalibrated. We can talk about this in the Q&As if you're not familiar and want to know more about it. Um, uh, recently, with, us, with the Ebola epidemic last year in West, uh, in West Africa, there were lots of, of discussions and debates about but why don't we get, we as researchers, get access to the cell phone data uh, and then try to map people's you know, journeys, movements to try and combat the epidemic? And it's actually m pretty complicated uh, and, and politically very sensitive. Uh, and we can also talk about why it's and how it's complicated and complex and, and sensitive um, in the Q&As. Then, okay, next slide. So this is the kind of stuff that you can do with cell phone data. Um, so I'm just going to spend really 30 seconds going over basically the sort of gist of how you do that. So essentially think of you have two data sets. One is your so-called ground truth data. So it's, it's a survey conducted by National Statistical Office or any other like official organization that tells you, well, in this country, this is, these are your different, different poverty levels or income levels, or it can be at the level of a city. So you have, this is your ground truth data. Then you have cell phone activity. From your cell phone activity, you extract features, meaning you create variables about the data that you have. And these variables can be duration of calls, uh, length of, of um, I mean, distance of calls, 
so like any patterns, any data variables that, that you can create out of your data set of cold detail records. So sort of like breadcrumbs that, that telcos uh, record. And, and then the, the, the trick is just to match them. So it's to find the best model that helps you translate whatever you see in cell phone activity in terms of poverty level. And the reason that it's, it's, it's doable is that poor and rich people use their phone very differently. So they leave very different digital signatures or traces. So you can actually find some correlations between both data sets. That's the sort of 101 crash course in how these maps are, are, are done. Uh, so this is a paper also in terms of predictive analytics that I've, I've been working on with, with uh, so other co-authors, where we try, to, we try to predict crime in, in London, in this case, using cell phone data. And it's the, same, it's the same like trick, basically. You have ground truth data, you actually know where crime happened, because we have like police reports. Um, so it can be underreported, it can be false, but it's like, it's the, you know, the best data that you have. And you try and see what is the pattern between cell phone activity, the, in the correlation between cell phone activity and crime. And, and that helps you predict crime in the future or in other locations. That's also the sort of big picture overview. And then I'm almost done. Uh, okay, so let's let's keep that. We can talk about it. So this is more the sort of uh, how it's done in terms of uh, like prediction versus actual, and the product the predictive power is just the sum of of the diagonal of a, of a matrix. And that's pretty pretty simple. Okay, so let's wrap up in terms of if you want to go beyond measurement. Of course, there are very serious um, so like ethical questions and concerns that are raised by the sort of emergence of, of big data. Privacy is one. Uh, disempowerment um, is another that is, that is related. So, um, and there is this sort of like false notion that if only we, have, we had all the data in the world, we will solve the world's problems. Uh, and one problem is that we don't really know who we are, who is to like, use this data, and how these data can be used, accessed, et cetera. Uh, and it gets to notions like digital divide, uh, if you will. Then, and this is the second to last slide, uh, so one key thing that I think is worth stress stressing is that, as I said, it's not, it's not really not just a technical question. I mean, the same things have happened over and over again with all technological innovation. There is a first like hype, oh, it's going to solve the world's problems and, and we're going to find solutions. And so and this, this solutionistic approach is, is actually very salient and, and, and risky in the case of big data. And I think this, this quote, uh, I mean, is a good summary of like what of my perspective, um, that it's, yeah, that we should go beyond the, the geeks. I mean, in a sense, I guess a lot of you would self-identify maybe um, as, 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 as geeks. Uh, well, and I would identify myself as a bean counter because I've worked in a national statistical office. Uh, and we sort of have to so like both work together and, 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 and work like beyond ourselves. Uh, so with people um, who produce and need the data. And last slide, um, and also in terms of applications, so, so there are lots of uh, work being done uh, to, so to develop new techniques, new approaches. So this is more the sort of technical stuff. Uh, but sample bias correction is, of course, a big one uh, because we all know that not everybody has a cell phone, not everybody uses Twitter. Uh, so these are very biased data sets. Uh, but that's not a problem in itself uh, if you actually know how to correct for, for the sample bias. So this is one, just one uh, of these um, so like frontier work uh, that, is, that is being done. OK, I'm done. Cool, thanks. Do you want to give me the recording mic back? OK, so um, I'm just going to give you guys an example of a project that's trying to use uh, data to build climate resilience, which is my own. Um, and we're doing it in Earth Engine. How many of you have heard of Earth Engine? Will you raise your hand so I just like get a sense? Okay, so almost all of you. Um, if you haven't, then you should just Google that right now and take a look. Um, what Earth Engine is, is a repository of uh, data that's already freely available, um, that's now in the cloud, but it's been stitched together and cleaned in a lot of ways that make it easier for analysis. So any of you have ever done remote sensing analysis for environmental science, you know that clouds are such a pain. Um, 
and stitching together different tiles can be a pain as well and if you can clean up that data really quickly um, you can ask questions over a much larger spatial scale and over a much deeper time. Um, so that's what's really exciting to me as a scientist about um, Earth Engine. And then the second thing is um, it's like hyper parallel processing. So each pixel is sent to a different server when a calculation is run and then it gets all put back together. Um, so that means that analyses that would take you on your own laptop or even on a supercomputer at a university weeks, months, or years to run happen now on a time scale of a much lower magnitude. Um, and so that enables us to ask different questions as well. Um, so one of the kind of the famous Earth Engine examples and really what it was built for was to make the highest resolution deforestation map <laughs> globally. Um, this is done by Hansen et al. It was the cover of Science Magazine about a year and a half ago. Um, you should also check this out if you haven't. You can download all of the data and look up their methods um, and zoom into different areas in the world and see where forests have um, been lost and regrown over the past decade. Um, and it, this would have been virtually impossible without something like Google Earth Engine. Um, so that's kind of a classic example. And really, there's been a flowering of projects now as Google Earth Engine has uh, issued research awards. So a lot of scientists have applied for funding and are testing this in a lot of cool ways. Um, so I got a research award. And I'm trying to understand um, how we can model flood vulnerability um, at global scales. So my first foray into this um, in learning about Earth Engine was to just start checking out what kinds of data sets are already available. So elevation, slope, impervious surface, um, <coughs> and other hydrologic data sets called flow accumulation are in there. And you can calculate other variables from that to try and get a sense of where a place might be uh, biophysical risk for flooding. Um, on the other hand, you can upload your own data. So we've uploaded a lot of census data into Earth Engine um, and are calculating different variables to understand social risk. Um, as you all probably know, with all of the disasters we've um, had in the past decade or so, that it's really this combination of where there's a biophysical risk and a social risk that a hazard actually turns into a disaster and where people are exposed. Um, so we presented some of these initial ideas at the Crisis Mappers Conference in Nairobi um, a little over a year ago and have since gotten a lot of um, interest. Um, one was from the state of New York. So we used some funding from um, uh, Hurricane Sandy Reconstruction to build this model to run on each watershed uh, for the state of New York and understand who is most vulnerable to flooding and where based on indicators we've developed. Um, and if you have more questions about this, please ask. I have all of these codes ready to pull up and show you any of the nitty gritty details you want to know um, about these models. So I'm going to skip it um, for time. And we ran the same model on Senegal. Since this data was globally available, we could basically just zoom in to another part of the world and the algorithm um, runs again. Um, and so we did a small project um, with Emmanuel using uh, call detail records to try to get a better estimate of population density and add that into our flood vulnerability model. Um, we're n we just started a project with uh, the World Bank in Uttarakhand, India, to try and understand how to use Google Earth Engine to look at how rivers have changed. There was major flooding there in 2013. Um, and because we have uh, kind of an easy way to access a lot of satellite imagery, run a cloud-free algorithm, we can look at um, where the new rivers are shifting and where fluvial erosion might happen in the future. Because um, one thing that can happen, um, especially in a very mountainous region, is you'll have a river that meanders further and further and further. And then when a disaster happens, the water will rush through and cut off a meander bend. So you really want to be able to predict where that might happen. Um, for disaster risk reduction. So we're working on that for India. And then the project I'm most excited about is um, trying to apply this to climate change. So um, my, co my colleague that I mentioned earlier, um, who works for the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication, um, a lot of their research shows that people have to feel connected in some way um, to climate change at a personal level. Um, and one way that that's been effective is through disaster. So you guys might remember after Hurricane Sandy, all of the tweets that were happening about climate change and 
um, proclamations by Bloomberg about it's climate change stupid and so we really want to kind of capitalize on that energy and that connection um, and build a flood model that people can zoom into type in their zip code download the data um, if you're a city planner um, maybe you can get a better estimate of what flood risk looks like for your city and apply for more funding to do more advanced modeling we think about this more as a hotspot tool um, and so we're piloting this on the US right now with our Google Earth Engine grant. So this is um, what we hope to sort of produce, is basically if you can look at a flood risk area for different return periods now, and then under different emission scenarios, figures out, figure out who's most socially vulnerable in those places, um, and build a kind of contiguous map for the whole US, and eventually the world. So that's kind of where we're going this, with this, and this model is very much in development. Um, one of the really challenging things, though, about actually doing modeling, verifying, and trying to calibrate a model um, in Earth Engine is that because of the parallel processing, you can't run any typical hydrologic modeling routine. So if any of you kind of know about how some of these work, Normally, just think about the way that water flows. You need to know what's happening upstream from you and upstream from upstream of you and so forth and do a lot of differential equations and finite differencing methods. And so these sort of flow algorithms you need to do do not work in Earth Engine because of this parallel, hyper-parallel processing. So, um, so we are trying to think of another way. Um, and so we're actually started looking into um, logistic regression and geographically weighted regression. Um, and the Google engineers have now convinced us to do some more research on machine learning classification algorithms. Um, and so that's kind of our next approach. And I can show you that code and some of the algorithms that we've tested so far in Earth Engine. Um, and of course, this depends on having a lot of good flood observation data. So Earth Engine is now uploading um, a repository of flood events, and I can use that data to match a flood event with what was the land cover at the time, what was impervious surface at the time, and any other time dependent variables I might want to extract and build a model over and over again in the same location. Um, and we're also working on changing hazards. So we know that climate change changes uh, the level at which precipitation is distributed. Um, and so we have to add that in to understand how climate change will uh, affect floodplains. Uh, we also have to look at social variables. Um, I won't get into the weeds on this unless you really want to know. Um, but we're using principal component analysis on census data and starting to do some multi-level regressions with storm damage data. Um, with NCDC, which is, the, which is the damage database that the U.S. has, um, to actually try and validate some of these social variables that we've defined. Um, happy to talk more about that. Um, so getting back sort of to the biophysical risk, the basic workflow is this. You get a flood observation. Um, these red areas you see in this image is detected water um, from a MODIS tile from a satellite. So you can accumulate many of these for each location. Get the relevant variables in Earth Engine. Um, so I'll pull up my code and show you, but we include things like slope, elevation, Euclidean distance to the nearest river or water feature, impervious surface, and so forth. And then build a model with a machine learning algorithm, um, test its accuracy, and repeat over as many events as you can for one location. And then loop that through all the watersheds in the US. Um, but we also have to figure out, for each storm event, um, what was the rainfall at that time? So there's rainfall data in Earth Engine. There's several different data sets you can pull from for that. And then figure out, um, how frequent was this event in the context of that specific location? Um, so was this a 100-year flood? Was it a 20-year flood? Um, and NOAA has some data sets that predict that for every, it, it's like a, one kilometer resolution grid everywhere in the US. So what's the 24 hour event, 100 year return period based on precipitation data. So we can kind of label each flood event as its frequency and its uh, own local distribution. Um, and then the second part is getting climate projections into the Earth Engine sort of model. Um, yeah, so 
that's sort of the process we're using to extract differences in floodplains. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to pull up the code, but if you ask a question, I'm totally happy to and show you some of the machine learning algorithms we've used. Um, so we're hoping to get this ready to release before the big climate change conference in Paris, which is happening in late November. So hopefully this will be all finished by October and we're looking for collaborators and I would love feedback. Um, come find me later on during this conference. Um, okay, and I've just finished like two minutes to give you uh, sort of like institutional overview uh, of the Apple Alliance. Uh, and if you want to, so if you want to you know, be involved, uh, you can email me. I'll give you my uh, email afterwards. So um, essentially, the way it's set up is it's like a distributed network. Uh, so the, the, the core is, at, is in New York, and we're incubated by a software consulting company called Popworks. Uh, so we have offices also at MIT Media, uh, Harvard Media Initiative, and, and OEM in the UK. We have a, uh, a, a number of research affiliates. So Beth and Bessie are both research affiliates. Um, and then the way we're going to work or we work is that we have uh, so we have a number of projects that are funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, World Bank, uh, and other institutions. And we work in different areas, like thematic areas. Climate change and resilience is one of them. And all this work is around, like, is animated by working groups. Um, and there's, a, there's another one on poverty and inequality, another one on conflict and, and crime, for instance, another one on ethics and privacy. So if you're interested in you know, knowing more, being involved, uh, just send me an email. Um, in terms of, and this is my last slide, in terms of like how we work, so we do research and innovation, so that's the first, um, like, so the, the, the first like uh, thematic, uh, sorry, like, uh, priority uh, component. Then we, we do training and cap so capacity building uh, and, and we try to create connection in the, new, in this, in the big data space. Uh, so our work on training is going to be funded by the Hewlett Foundation. And then we try to work and think uh, around like ethical or critical systems. Uh, for instance, the question of who owns cell phone data? And, and, and is, it, is, it, is it Vodafone or AT&T or is it the, 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 the people actually emitting data? Uh, so it's the kind of thing we sort of work and, and, and think about. Uh, and then last night is just my email. Um, I don't have it. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, I'll send you my email. Uh, I could find uh, it. <laughs> yeah, we can do it. Great. So that's all we had. I realize we're running into lunch, but um, if anyone has questions or kind of wants to respond to others' ideas or thoughts they have from working in this space, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Thanks for your speech. I would like to know if uh, all of these data are open now for the reading. You can consult it because I try to make the query in Google or something. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so um, Earth Engine already works with data that's already totally open. Um, if you just go to. That's sort of my code. This is the Earth Engine API, so you have to sign up for access to this, but you just kind of fill out a form and get access within 24 hours. And uh, it uses JavaScript to call the data and build sort of any model you want. Um, but Earth Engine, if you go to, I think it's earthengine.google.org, that should pull it up. And then it'll show you sort of all of the different data sets you can draw from. It has its own sort of GUI here, so you can add whatever data you want in to the GUI and do simple calculations, or you can sign up for API access. Yeah, does that answer your question? Oh, about the flood data? Oh, um, we are just kind of this week adding in that <laughs> flood data. Yeah, and we're pulling from the uh, Dartmouth Flood Observatory observation data set that's basically just a water algorithm from MODIS. So that should be available in the next week or so. Because we've kind of had to work with Google to like prod them to add <laughs> more data that we want for this model. Yeah, sorry, I didn't understand your question. Other questions yeah, or comments? Question. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so <laughs> 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 Okay, uh, like, do you have like three days or? <laughs> um, I mean, so first, so we're gonna have a, a, like a half a day event at MIT Media Lab on April 11th, uh, 
right after the biggest conference in the US on cell phone data analysis, which is called NetMob. You can look up the, it's netmob.org. Um, and so we're organizing a panel discussion exactly on that to try and basically think about what is going to be the future, the future ethical and policy framework for uh, cell phone data access, sharing, and, and protection and ownership. So if I were to, add, to answer the question like uh, very, like in just like 30 seconds, I think, I think we sh I think if it, because it's almost impossible, I mean, I've been thinking about this for like two years and I'm still not clear on. So because it's almost impossible to guarantee anonymization or, like, or non-identification, uh, I think that the rights to the data should be uh, should be in, in people's hands. So people, as in like societies, um, but the, the default right now, because because the, the technology has has gone so fast, um, so our thinking and legal frameworks haven't been able to but to just like you know keep up with the technology. So the default right now is that since the data is held by telcos, it's assumed that, that they own it, that, that holding is owning, and that they can, at their, at their discretion, give, it, give, them out, give them out for challenges or, or stuff like that. I think it's good for tactical purposes, but in the long run, this is not a right model. So the right model would be one where we say, okay, so like you hold the data, you're responsible for protection, um, and you need to get also fair returns on your investments in infrastructure, etc. Uh, but essentially, how the data is shared with researchers, with uh, governments, with uh, uh, responders in crisis, this, this needs to be discussed uh, at, like, the, the, at the society level through like, legislative democratic processes. Uh, and right now it's completely blurry uh, and, and, and the status quo is, not, is just not sustainable. So I think the rights to the data, so it's not the data themselves, the rights to the data should be, there should be a, a transfer from being in the hands of uh, telcos to, um, to, to being granted to, uh, to people. Any other last questions or comments before we all head to lunch? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're sort of like the only causal connection I'm trying to make in, in the flood model is between um, rainfall and flooded area. So all of the other variables would just be sort of correlates to understand that relationship. Um, and so part of the challenge, I think, is getting enough events in one location to be able to quantify uncertainty for that. Um, and then in terms of the social vulnerability, most of it doesn't even have any causation or even correlation. Most of the uh, academic work, anyway, in social vulnerability has just been to run principal component analysis, look for variation in the data, and hope that that's somehow related to all of these different disasters. Um, the Social Vulnerability Index was developed by Susan Cutter in the University of South Carolina, and it's been very widely used, but um, has never been verified with damage data of who is actually most affected in a flood. And, how much income have they lost? And is that related to demographic variables? Um, I don't know if you want to answer the I mean, just correlation me causation for yeah, your project. Yeah, it's always been like an issue in, 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 in research and policy. And a lot of people make up, I mean, if you're a politician uh, and you see that you've done, uh, you've implemented a program and you see some outcome that was positive, you're going to claim that it was, there was a causal relationship. If it's negative, then you're going to say that there was no so anyway, the point is that it's, it's always very, very hard to make causal inference. Uh, so you usually need a very specific research design to be able to do that. Uh, and the challenge with big data is twofold. One, you have so many data that you will find correlations. 
you will mm -hmm. find correlations between the price of butter in Bangladesh and something else, and you're going to see like super nice fits. And if you go in Google Trends or Google Correlate, it's actually fun. You enter any any name, any any yeah any any word, and it finds you the best correlation in, in searches. And sometimes they have nothing to do with one another, uh, but there, it looks like the, the R square can be like 0.99. Uh, so you're going to get correlations. And then uh, the challenge is that is that these are passively emitted data, so it's actually hard to design dis like to design research frameworks <coughs> that you actually that you control that would allow you to make causal inference. The sort of best way to to do pro like program evaluation, for instance, is randomized controlled trials uh, that have also like ethical issues. But but you can't do like a randomized controlled trial, or it's actually very hard with with big data, just because you can't. Even you don't control your the ecosystem you're applying your like research uh, to. So to end, there are tools that are being built. So Google has like an open uh, I don't know if it's an app or an interface where they try to make causal inference in time series. So you can sort of Google that, and it's like a Bayesian method. So it basically tries to uh, give you like a likelihood that there is a causal relationship in between like two two data sets. But the, the, the biggest challenge is what I call like data literacy, is trying to or instill a new data culture to prevent people from like making false assumptions or making false claims. Um, and that's fully part of what I see as the sort of the requirements for, for like the sort of positive future of, a, of, a, of big data, to sort of to try and, and teach people, tell people um, that about all the risks um, that come with, uh, with big data? It's a good question, though. I'd love to talk about that more. I think we'd need to think about, too, what do we actually need to prove a causation with, and where is it okay to just assume a correlation? And most st statistical methods are just get, getting at correlation. And unless you're able to reproduce those results and test on many other independent events where you haven't used that training data in your model, I think it's hard to make that claim. And, and, and some people still say that Correlations like good enough. When you have a mm -hmm. lot of correlation, like systematically, then you're going to be better able to yeah know what's what's you know what's coming. Um, so Halvarian, for instance, um, uh, <coughs> like said and says that essentially correlation is like good enough for for uh, most stuff. I mean, of course, he knows like of all people that correlation is um, is different from causation, but it's, it's just a different a different type of news. Cool. I think where it's time for lunch. Um, so thank you all for listening, and hopefully we can talk later.